Trump's uh, chief of staff recently said that God must be punishing him. And, uh, and that's the way I feel this morning, being forced to following Laura. <laughs> uh, what, what the hell did I do wrong? <laughs> you know. So I'd, I'd like you to take a moment and lower your expectations. <laughs> okay? Um, I, I will feel much more comfortable and you'll be less disappointed. <laughs> um, speaking of Laura, I would like to thank Laura and thank David and thank Robin for inviting me to be here today and inviting all of us to be here. This, I'm sure it's gonna be a, a wonderful uh, couple of days after I finish my talk. Uh, <laughs> Since uh, this symposium is about uh, black leadership in part, I thought I'd start with some descriptive statistics. Uh, and these are from the Bureau of Labor Statistics last year, and it's based upon a household survey uh, of over 150 uh, homes, um, households, not homes, households. Uh, and uh, the Participation rate of blacks in the labor market is 12.1%. So you can see in these particular positions, blacks are underrepresented in all positions except human resource managers. Uh, later in my talk, I'm gonna raise that issue because you can look in these data and you can imagine that it's not infrequent for a black human resource manager to find him or herself as the token black on a management team. And I'm gonna talk about that token bit a, a little bit later. Um, these data look terrific compared to where I've spent most of my career, and most of my career I've been in business schools. And um, uh, uh, so let's, let's, let's look what business schools look like. 2% of business school deans are black. 4.2% uh, of faculty in business schools are black. Um, uh, a, a dear colleague my, of mine, Dolly Chug, offers uh, the, these data as an explanation of why we see relatively little research on race coming from business school faculty. And she doesn't mean, oh, you hire more blacks and blacks are gonna study blacks. She means that the whites within the schools are not exposed to blacks and don't see diversity as an issue. So most of the research we rely upon comes out of sociology and, and psychology. Not, not schools of business, regrettably. One of several plausible explanations for these data, not the business school data, but all the data I just showed, is racism. And that's the, that's the one explanation I'm gonna focus on uh, uh, today. Racism is a very confusing term. Uh, we tend to think that the constructs we study are, are relatively constant but we know that the very nature of racism has been transferred, transformed over, over time. Uh, let me begin with old fashioned racism, which I think most people on the street, when you say racism, think of the old fashioned type, where uh, blacks are construed of, thought of as biologically inferior and a belief in strict, strict seg segregation. Um, I hope you can read that. Um, you're gonna see and hear the name uh, Larry, Larry Bobo, who's here, uh, not here today, I don't see him, he's on the faculty here, because uh, I, I, I think he has uh, the best uh, available data uh, on white, white attitudes towards blacks. So my theme is, and the theme of a lot of people, <laughs> is that old-fashioned racism is declining. And 
Bobo and his colleagues identify wide attitudes towards what they call racial pr principles. And you can see there's, uh, uh, there, there's been a market decline, and it's really began in the 60s. Here he's plotted 72 through 2008. Market decline in um, whether blacks should go to separate schools. That's gone way down. Whether um, uh, you favor laws against intermarriage, that's gone way down. Uh, the right to segregate neighborhoods, that's gone way down. And what's gone down the least <coughs> is the right that home sellers uh, um, should be able to discriminate if they want to. I shouldn't be forced as, as, a, as a white to sell my home to a black. Um, a bit more of this data. Uh, these are white ratings of whites industriousness and intelligence compared to blacks. Who's smarter and who's lazier? Blacks or whites? What do whites think? Well, again, we, we see these declines uh, in, in the beliefs that whites are more hardworking and whites are more intelligent. Uh, we end up about, I think it's about 45% of whites think uh, they work harder than blacks, and about 35% of whites think they're smarter than blacks. These are the, these are the old-fashioned racists. Um, told you these data are not pretty. <laughs> okay. Um, the very latest data I could find, and this is from 2016, the General Social Science Survey, is that 39.8% of non-black respondents reported racial differences in inequality are due to blacks' lack of will. The reason you see the racial differences in inequality is because the blacks are lazy, uh, and 6.8% reported inequalities are due to, and this is the term from the survey, inborn disabilities, uh, that they're not very smart. Um, so this form of racism has really declined dramatically. Uh, uh, they're there, we have racist, old-fashioned racists with us, but th there are many, many fewer in number. Uh, this old-fashioned racism has been replaced by subtle forms of racism. And in social psychology, there, there are a bunch of these. Uh, 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 symbolic racism associated with seers, ambivalent racism associated with cats, adversive racism, most of the work done by Video and Gartner uh, and, and their colleagues, and then uh, modern racism happens to be my favorite, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit more detail in a second, okay? Um, and the video and Gardner explain this transformation <coughs> from old-fashioned racism to subtle racism uh, because of a change in social norms towards egalitarianism. Egalitarianism is much more accepted today. <clears throat> and changes in the law. Um, what's really important, I think, and you'll see this in a m moment in some of my data, is that not only have whites changed what they say about blacks, they've changed their self-concept. They no longer see themselves as racist, and they think racism is bad. So it's quite plausible, according to these different forms of subtle racism, for me to act in a discriminatory manner against the black, but call myself non-racist. <coughs> you may be seeing that almost every day out of the White House. Um, uh, but I'll get to the White House later. Um, OK, so this is McConaughey's modern racism. Uh, the form of racism I, I happen to study, and I'm not saying it's better than the others, it's just taste, my taste, this is what I study. 
Um, they believe discrimination is a thing of the past because blacks now have the freedom to compete in the marketplace and enjoy the things they can afford. Blacks are pushing too hard, too fast in the places they're not wanted. Black tactics and demands are unfair. Therefore, recent gains are undeserved and the prestige granting institutions of society are giving blacks more attention and status than they deserve. Like today's conference at Harvard. Why in the hell are we having a meeting about race? Um, now it gets really interesting psychologically. The above belief do not constitute racism. They're empirical facts. That means if I'm a modern racism, what I just read to you is the truth. Okay, I'm not saying it is the truth. <laughs> I'm saying modern racists believe it's the truth. Non-debatable facts. They, the, they believe racism is bad. Now it gets more and more interesting behaviorally. They act in ways to protect a non-prejudicial, non-discriminatory self-image. So a modern racist would never want to be seen as a racist and never want to see him or herself as a racist. Therefore, they act out against blacks only if they have a plausible, non-prejudiced justification for doing so. So in, in my work, what I call it, you, you, you give a modern racist a, uh, an excuse, in my first study they're called business justifications, this beast of modern racism comes out. Without the non-racist, and you'll see a couple of examples, uh, the non-racist excuses to act, you know, I mean going back to the busing days, I oppose busing because buses are dangerous. Okay, that would, that would be an example. Okay, the piece of research I want to quickly describe uh, was done my, by myself and uh, several other colleagues in 2000. Uh, and um, it was inspired by uh, the case of Shoney's, which I found over and over again, unless you're a southerner, not many people know about it. You're shaking your head. <laughs> you know, the case of Shoney's to me is just, just fascinating. At the time in the 90s, it was a restaurant chain with uh, 1,800 units in 36 states. And it was forced to pay $132.5 million uh, for discrimination against its black employees. And uh, it's a much smaller, it's still around if you drive around the South, but it's a much, much smaller organization today. <coughs> the t company from the top down and the founder and CEO lost his job over this, from the top down believed that if you match customers to service personnel, you're gonna perform better, okay? A lot of people believe that, by the way. It, 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 it used to be, I hope it's not today, taught in the diversity classrooms as a means of diversifying. It's illegal. Uh, and, and it leads to discrimination, as it did at Shoney's. So you, uh, in terms of court testimony, some of the folks said like, if a unit was performing under par, a manager was told to, quote, lighten up the unit and hire, quote, attractive white girls. Such tactics left, led to 1.8% of Sony's managers being black, and 75% of all the blacks um, that worked in the restaurant worked in positions that were not visible to the customer, like dishwasher, short order cook, okay? And uh, I, I really got very intrigued about it and uh, about this case. And we conducted uh, two experiments, and in a few moments I'm gonna criticize experiments, <laughs> We conducted two experiments. Uh, we used an in-basket <coughs> methodology where uh, folks played the role of an organizational decision maker and one of the things they had to do was make some recommendations about hiring. 
okay? And, and um, the portfolio of applicants they looked at were, were blacks and whites. <coughs> um, the business justification, the non-prejudiced reason for attacking, oh, by the way, modern racism was measured one month before the participants in the experiment. So it's a pretty big time lag, okay? So the uh, first one was we need to hire a new human resource manager and the person, uh, our workforce is lily white and the person would perform much, much better if he or, or she was also white. So now I have an excuse to discriminate so I can make more money. It's a business justification. Uh, and the second experiment, uh, uh, we were recruiting in, in the experiment uh, a marketing representative to sit on a team of all whites. And so the team was all whites and the customers they sold to were all whites. And they were also told that, you know, a black would probably have a difficult time adjusting to working in that type of setting. So again, that was another type of business justification. Well, so what we found, modern racist attitudes affected discrimination, predicted discrimination, only when the subjects, the participants, were provided with business justifications to discriminate. There was an interaction effect. That's pretty subtle versus old-fashioned racism. And I um, really want to tell you my next experiment. Uh, let, me, let me try to do and, and this has been replicated, by the way, by, by uh, Zygarde and uh, uh, Hanji's using the uh, um, implicit association test. Okay, not modern racism. Okay, uh, so the conceptual stick of my talk, which I'll do real quick, is, uh, and I'm using the term mechanism, organizational mechanisms here, the way that uh, Barbara Ruskin did in her 2002 uh, presidential address to the American Sociological Association where she was trying to explain uh, inequality within organizations. Um, and so, so we have racism driving, uh, one of the mechanisms is business justifications. What I'm about to talk about next and very quickly is tokenism, but there are a whole bunch of other mechanisms, okay? And, and the argument would be, instead of focusing on reducing racism, you focusing, focus on changing the mechanisms within the organization in order to improve outcomes. The next study I was gonna show was tokenism. We, we uh, went through uh, uh, an association of black executives, uh, utility executives, and we measured, uh, I gotta put up one of these, uh, we, we measured their token status, were they tokens in their organization or not. Um, uh, we measured stereotype threat, um, and this is Steele and Aronson, the fear of confirming a negative stereotype about one's group through one's own behavior. It's activated in situations where the stereotype is perceived as relevance to one's performance. So if you're a black executive, you're a token, we're predicting you're gonna experience uh, stereotype threat. And to my knowledge, this is uh, the first field study of stereotype threat. Lots of stuff in the lab which I won't talk about. Um, and what we found <coughs> is among black professionals, solo status, being a token in the group, is associated positively with stereotype threat. And experiencing stereotype threat at work uh, reduces their feedback-seeking behavior, trying to figure out how they're doing, and it increases them discounting feedback. So if they get negative feedback, they discount it. If they get positive feedback, they discount it, which has got to hurt your performance. Okay, I'm about to end. 
I, I want to end on a, a note that everything I said might have been wrong about subtle racism. And, and now I'm going to go back to uh, Larry Bobo. Uh, very recently, uh, he wrote that Trump, and he's not the only person saying this, uh, Trump's campaign and presidency has unleashed previously marginalized and shrinking influence in, 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 and shrinking. He's allowed you to say and do and think things that re, re, we, we, we have gotten rid of, going from old-fashioned racism to subtle racism. So the issue may be, we may be going straight back to where we were. And his data for this is the increase in number of uh, uh, hate groups uh, identified by the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center. Uh, during the Trump era, they've increased 17% in the United States up to 917. Um, that's, that's a pretty, pretty big jump. Thank you, and I'm sorry I had to rush so much. <laughs> <laughs>